Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the webinar today in which we will be talking about how not to lose your customers this year. I have with me Hamza Nasir, who is the Director of Strategic Relations for Live Admins DMCC, and today he will be sharing with us some customer retention strategies. We will also be taking your questions, so feel free to send them to us via the chat box that you can see, and you can also tweet your questions by using the hashtag LAWebinar. So without waiting any further, over to you, Hamza. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I can see that we have a few people on board already. Uh, I was wondering if we should give it a few more minutes for people to come in, but then I figured there's some people that are already here, so we should start. Uh, I was really hoping the presentation was actually called How to Lose Your Customers, because I can go at length to talk about that. Unfortunately, however, today we're going to talk about how to try and not lose your customers. So um, we have a, a lot of elements that we're going to go about, and if you have any questions like Noreen mentioned, please join in. Uh, this could be a monologue that bores you off, or you could interact with us. Let us know the problems that you're facing, uh, how are you retaining customers, and uh, how are things happening uh, in your world so we can work with you on that. So to start it off, uh, we're going to be going through certain elements that we believe are important. This is based on our own experience. We've been doing uh, customer experience related activities for more than the last 15 years and I personally have been a part of this organization for about a decade now. Uh, to start things off, um, we'll just consider an example of the, uh, the Note 7 fiasco. So they've lost some customers there. A lot of devices have been recalled, but now with the launch of the S8, the problems that they're now facing, they're going to try and retain the same audience base, which makes all these activities that they now perform crucial for Samsung to come up strong. Um, a similar example that comes in my mind would be Vodafone paying millions of dollars because of bad customer service. And you have to focus on the customer to ensure that they're getting what they should be expecting. So not too, not too long ago, uh, we'll talk about a basic report from HBR, for example. Um, it is expected between five and 25 times more of a cost if you were to get a new customer versus retaining an existing one. So a lot of these businesses these days would focus more towards getting more customers instead of focusing on the ones that they have at hand. Uh, similarly, uh, a key factor, for example, if I were to ask the audience here, what do you believe uh, would be a key factor that would result in you losing uh, a certain brand or you no longer working with a certain company that you would otherwise work with? Um, according to uh, an Oracle report, nine out of 10 customers have abandoned a business entirely because of poor customer experience. And this happens to be the actual deciding factor between retention and turnover. Uh, one of the top research companies in the world, Bain & Co, cite that it is a customer is four times more likely to go to your competitor if the problem is service-related uh, versus price or product-related. And this brings me to the point where you have to consider the fragility of brand loyalty itself. We are way more open to switching a brand now as compared to to now switch from an iPhone to a Samsung S8, the latest flagship that they released. And according to a customer experience index study by Aspect, 50% of millennials, for example, would abandon a brand every year. And add some more to it, 25% of millennials would abandon a brand after a single bad experience. And with more than 82% then leaving the business based on three experiences for instance. So we'll now uh, run into the key elements of what we believe are the most important for customer retention. I would urge the audience to join in and let us know what you believe is the most important part. So given on the key elements, we'll start with, I believe, what is one of the most important, which would happen to be quality. So good quality would improve the brand's image. You have to meet the customer's expectations, improve the long-term profitability and revenue, the value that you generate, and unfortunately, poor quality 
would increase your cost. A couple of examples that I would have in mind uh, to cue in on this. For, for more than 10 years, Apple happens to have retained its customers by raising the quality bar in its products and services. Similarly, uh, a couple of brands that I can think of, Porsche, Ferrari, Lamborghini, amazing examples of how high quality is maintained and high quality products are provided decade on decade. Um, another retail example would be, for instance, the body shop. And they would continue the mission of delivering the highest quality skin and beauty products and yet keep them at affordable pricing. All the while while maintaining the unyielding commitment to human and animal rights, which makes the difference, which makes them stand out, which makes them a key example of why I would bring them in under quality. Um, next that I can think of would be price. So one has to align the pricing strategy with the customer satisfaction goals. You want to ensure that the customers understand what they're getting for and they get value in what they pay for. An example that we picked up in this case would be uh, traditional companies that you would be easily able to name and then Far East OEMs producing technologies that would compete in terms of features by providing competitive features overall and yet providing them at almost ridiculously low pricing. Um, a couple of examples uh, would be the LG G6 for instance, feature rich and yet very high value for the cost. And um, one more example that I cannot miss since I've, I've, I'm touching upon cell phones here, the One Plus One and the series that they've come up with. Um, these are examples that are giving essentially Samsung and Apple run for their money. And this is entirely because customers are now considering more than just what they're getting. They're now becoming smarter about differentiating the different packages that are coming through. And they're open to switching to new technologies, to new companies. And that is one of the key factors that is impacting uh, the overall customer retention space. Uh, one more thing that we would usually not ignore would be innovation. Certain companies are competing entirely on the basis of what is now being provided. Innovation essentially is improving what you currently have. Businesses continuously lose customers because they fail to anticipate customer desires, changing trends and technological advancements. We'll try to be pushing a little more on that uh, as, as we go. A uh, couple of examples that I would come up, come up in my mind, Nokia, Blackberry. Uh, remember the speech that uh, one of the Microsoft executives made, which was essentially talking about Apple and how the iMate does everything that a customer would want? And imagine from that point on, where are we at right now? Businesses need to understand that customers will actually go ahead and pay premium for innovation because they'd rather get what they want and disregard the actual price piece at the same point. A um, couple of examples, um, not a business per se, the government of Dubai, it continues to amaze me the amount of effort that they're putting in into people, understanding why they need to set a benchmark for up to the entire world. An example that I can think of is uh, the Hyperloop that they're setting up and the way they'll be connecting the various Emirates, essentially working on the future of transportation and how new laws are constantly passed in terms of drones, in terms of autonomous transportation, for instance. And um, Dubai Police, for example, that is launching Android Police effective within another four years. That is pure innovation. And Dubai happens to be an example that I have to mention in that case. And last but not least, a customer-centric approach, keeping customer as the actual first priority where every single action that is made and every single process that you have in place revolves entirely around your customer. Um, a few examples that I would, I would have in mind, um, and this would entail exceptional customer experience because it is built around the customer, as well as creating a wow factor per se. So DHL Germany, for example, started a parcel copter skyport. Yeah, you should Google that because it's it's a complicated keyword even for me. But the idea here being that it can reduce delivery times by more than half the usual time. 
Uh, something that I just had read up, which is about the Souk acquisition, is that Souk is delivering, let's say, the items the next day with Alabar's noon.com promising a three-hour delivery spot. I mean, that's what e-commerce is now competing on because these guys understand they're against retail, and e-commerce is only 2% of whatever is happening in the region right now, which makes it a huge space to compete. And Amazon hopefully will be essentially increasing and banking on what uh, Souk actually has started. And you have to work on going beyond what was just considered satisfactory because that is not what will keep them coming. Understanding that the approach is changing, loyalty is constantly going down. Consider the Apple's Genius Bar, for instance. And it is a direct emulation of the hotel's concierge. And that is an innovation that gets people to come back to Apple over and over again. A few more examples, and if I just say the names, you'd understand why. Starbucks, Harley Davidson, Marriott, for instance. These guys are known for creating essentially a community of customers that relate to the experience that they get, something that starts their day off, something that they cannot essentially live without. A um, few examples that I would have in mind, uh, Dubai International Airport, uh, disaster recovery that they had in place uh, when one of the aircrafts, I believe, caught fire with the crash landing in August 2016, or the Commercial Bank of Dubai that is now focusing on a seven-minute first contract resolution, which is itself a revolution in the banking industry. So given all of that, um, one of the things that we would like to establish is everything needs to essentially revolve around the customer going beyond the expectation and go the extra mile once in a while. Um, one example which, which came up is something that the Ritz-Carlton did. So they, they wowed the Hearn family when one of their toddlers forgot his stuffed toy. A stuffed toy. Now that could have very easily been handed over as is. And there's a name for it, Joshi the Giraffe. And that's what this toddler has, had left at the hotel. The father told the son that Joshi was essentially taking an extended vacation. And he told the same story to the hotel, which happened to take adorable pictures of Joshi at various sections of the hotel actually showcasing and living up the story. And eventually they reunited Joshi with the owner alongside a goodies uh, full box. And this was all risk Carlton merchandise. But the simple gesture has made it to one of the top examples of how you can take something extremely simple and essentially convert it into a wow opportunity, completely changing the paradigm. I've gone through a few examples, but I want to make this a little interactive. So we'd like to publish a quick poll. And again, uh, like we've said earlier, if anybody would like to participate, we have the chat function open. Please go ahead and share your questions with us and let us know what you think. Uh, let's go ahead and participate in the poll. Just fill out uh, what do you guys think. So talk about the features that I mentioned. So talk about customer centricity, quality, pricing, what has impacted your business the most or the business that you represent or what have you. And if let's say you have anything else to add, if there's something that we may have missed, because again, we do have a time constraint, uh, I'd like to learn from you what exactly has impacted you and what would you focus on? Are you making any changes that would allow you to follow some of the examples that we mentioned. I mean, you know a lot of people, for instance, would refer to them as the Uber of XYZ. So Uber has made that kind of difference in the sharing economy where now people are relating to that as the next big thing. So we'll wait for some of the results to come down, but we'll probably not stop. We'll keep on proceeding from here. So uh, going further, we'll have the results to show you in a bit. So moving further, um, I want to touch upon uh, some of the technological trends that would be coming up next. I'm going to sift over them because when we looked at all the audience profiles, we've seen uh, that there are people that are coming in from various different industries. And some of these things you may already be doing, some of these you know, buzzwords perhaps you've already heard of. And I wanted to just go over these and just initiate a conversation around what is now happening, what is now trending, and more essentially, what's coming next? So what should you be prepared for in order to battle the challenges that 2017 ahead lies for you? So to start things off, Internet of Things, we've all heard about this mostly. And uh, what is the actual term? The idea being 
a computing concept that describes everyday physical objects being connected to the internet and identify themselves to other devices. So imagine inanimate objects connected to the internet through which you can collect data and make everything smart, starting from a light bulb, going to your fridge, your air conditioning, everything is going to be connected. Um, according to the MWC uh, this year, which is the Mobile World Congress, uh, more than 50 billion devices are expected to be connected to the 5G network. The reason why 5G is not coming up as fast as it should is because of the amount of bandwidth that they've realized they would be needing and the amount of devices, autonomous cars, for example, to all be connected to the Internet. So examples which are going to become omnipresent, smart vending machines, self-diagnostic appliances, home automation, variable gadgets, for example. And something that follows this closely, which is support robotics. So the evolution of robotics itself, of where it has come, and how far is it going to go? So you're going to see more and more robots coming into the conversation. So they call it the third industrial era now. And automation has always been in place. I mean, I was, I was in a plane yesterday, and I just happened to have met the, the pilot in the cockpit. And I asked him, how hard is it for Boeing or Airbus, for example, to automate your job? And he, his answer was, I'm not doing much here anyway. I'm usually involved in case something goes south. Otherwise, essentially, the complete operation was being controlled by itself. And this was a 20-year-old aircraft, according to the pilot himself, which was scary. But the idea being, that's how automation works. Robotics is going to essentially change the way things work. And examples that you would be seeing sooner rather than later, sweeper robots, map guiding machines, delivery drones, or the quadcopters, for instance, that are actively being used by the Road and Transport Authority. Uh, moving further, augmented and virtual reality. And we, we expect, and this is, uh, this is Gartner essentially speaking, that more than 70% of all retail operations are going to have one form of augmented or virtual reality in place. And businesses are essentially merging the actual reality with the virtual. The first example is a, a picture of Mark Zuckerberg that stays in my mind. What Facebook is now doing. Virtual reality puts people first. It's all about who you're with, and once you're in there, you can do anything you want together. I mean, starting from the most basic example, travel to Mars, play games, fight with swords, watch movies, teleport home to see your family. I mean, imagine Google Street View. With a VR glasses on, you could be walking in the streets of Italy if you wanted, or be, be playing one of these MMORPG games in which you could be the one holding the actual weapon and in a war zone within a couple of clicks. I mean, that's, it's crazy. Snapchat filters, for example, that are the most more common ones, one of the implementations that we see a lot more, and uh, enhancing customer engagement through that. So people are creating their own uh, filters, for instance, that are getting a lot of that going. Conversational commerce is something that we believe is going to be huge. But what exactly is conversational commerce? It is seen as the natural evolution of digital shopping, and it is the act essentially of purchasing goods entirely through online conversations. And the key driving force behind this essentially are millennials. The mass uh, adoption of smartphones, AI-powered chatbots, for example, will arm businesses with the ability to engage millennials through these messaging apps. But in the end, we also believe that this requires to be personal. The way I would code it is the technology may have changed, the trends may have changed, but the way the transactions happen are all the same. So my business itself, for more than the last 10 years, has been enabling what is now referred to as conversational commerce. We provide human beings, as well as a combination with bots, a pre-bot, as well as a post-bot solution, as well as training programs on how to prepare teams to be ready for this new wave of smarter customers and how to engage the audience, how to wow the audience, and how to ensure that every single conversation is essentially an opportunity for you to explore. How can you turn a customer who's, let's say, not happy with your experience to actually be cross-sold to, or uh, I would say up-sold to, for example, 
and how to change that, that conversation into an opportunity. So for the last uh, decade or so, I've been involved with this directly. We've been providing a fully responsive 24-7 multilingual solution as well as training activities and custom designed training kits that enables your customer service front facing as well as all of your other teams to get more involved with the customer and work towards the wow factor because that's what will keep them coming. To learn more about that, there's some handouts and uh, we're happy to share more information. My website, for example, liveadmins.com is open 24 seven for business. So the moment you go in, one of my people would be happy to start interacting with you, take any question that you may have, and essentially provide you one of the best online customer experiences that is as of now possible. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions because uh, it is kind of lonely in here. Uh, do we have any questions that we can pull up? Um, so we have quite a few questions coming in. Um, one of the questions uh, is from Ibrahim, and he wants to know uh, what are the key indicators that help in identifying customers who might abandon? This would, this would go back to the basics. Um, you know when some, I mean, it obviously depends on how personalized you are and how close you are to the customer. So in a face-to-face -face interaction, you would know exactly what the expression of the customer is. In a more, I would say, a virtual interaction, uh, one of the terms very common in the call center or the contact center space would be the NPS. And this is one value through which you can determine what percentage of your customers are active promoters who love your product or your service to the extent that they would actually talk about it. This is usually around 20% of the range. 60% of the range then would be people that like your product, but they're prone to switching. And then there's a percentage that would that's basically going to leave the moment they get an opportunity, which could be based on quality, a bad experience. And you have to work with your customer. You have to understand, you have to listen. It could be based on social listening. It could be based on data. It could be based on surveys. But more or less, you have to interact with your customer to figure out how do they actually feel about your product or service and can you do something better to get them to come back to you and constantly make these changes to get this this interaction going so it's a process that is ongoing you need to constantly engage your current customers and work with them to ensure that they stay with you right uh, we have another question here Nora wants to know as a small business how can I compete with the bigger uh, companies uh, in my locality? So internet, it's the internet itself enables business to actually do this right from the beginning. Um, we, are living, we live in the world where anyone can create a Facebook page and essentially any mom and pop store could compete against a Fortune 500 at the click of a few buttons. It goes down to what is it that you're selling? What is your product? And you as a person, how personal is it? Can people relate to your mission? We've all seen those examples come up on Kickstarter, for instance, where people have taken very simple applications and they've innovated on them to create a difference. We've, we've seen people that would otherwise, I mean, 10 years ago, possibly not exist as a business that have converted opportunities or simple problems that they solved, which would which have actually made the difference. Case in point being Uber, Airbnb, for instance. These were simple ideas that focus on the customer first. How customers think, what would they prefer, what kind of economies are there that you can scale on? And they've taken these simple opportunities and by the usage of internet, social media, and by the fact that you can now go viral, which is actually beyond a disease, can actually make the difference. So all you need to do is essentially be creative and then work with that to move further. Right, we have another question here. Isn't the raise in technology such as AI and AR, AR causing decrease in human touch, which is the core of customer service? Rajesh, uh, thank you for this question. Um, I'm, I was actually speaking about the exact same question in one of the conferences in Abu Dhabi. So. Um, I'll just repeat the question. So the raise in technology essentially would 
deviate from human touch? That's the question. Um, truth is, human beings love human beings, but I'll just put it back at you. Do you make more phone calls or are you texting people more than that? So if I compare the amount of minutes you've spent on the phone calling people that you love or you're friends with, and I compare that with WhatsApp, it's just another channel, really. In the end, the human touch remains important. I mean, what my company does, for example, is to try and provide a human touch in a binary world, per se. But in the end, I'll give you the example of Airbnb. So unfortunately, in one of these cases, I happen to have a bad uh, experience with one of these new sharing economy providers. In that case, I mean, when you book, uh, let's say, a hotel room or a residence through Airbnb or when you book a car through Uber, essentially there's no human being involved. And all you do is you just tap a smartphone screen a few times and all of a sudden you have a booking and that's about it. The importance, however, remains in case something goes south, in which my, in my case actually it did. So now all of a sudden I need to get in touch with an Airbnb representative and they needed to be available. There was a phone number, there was an email address. So like I said earlier, where again I quote myself, the rules are the same. The tools have changed. And this is just these are just new tools. In the end, people will eventually still be working with humans. The only difference is there are a lot of nu nuisances that you could essentially automate, which you don't have to do. I mean, it is like accepting the fact that if your car drove itself and if you were at peace with that, truth is it will be one of the best things that would ever happen to you. I mean, I mean, I will just ask people to raise their hands if there's anybody in here who likes to get stuck in traffic. I mean, I'll raise my hand. I don't. Imagine if the car just drove you from point A to point Z and you could work or have your coffee or, I don't know, talk with the people that you love, for instance. I'd love to have that. So the core of the customer service remains what it is. I completely agree with you. However, you need to be available where people are. And essentially, it is still people interacting on the other end. You need to be available whenever there's a need. And there will be people that will choose to still call you or show up in the actual retail store. And there will be people who would rather tweet at you or do a Snapchat. So you need to be available. You need to constantly focus on it. And again, put the customer first. So that's how I'd address it. Do we have any more? Um, Hamza, we have quite a few more questions coming in. However, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, we'll answer your questions via email. Um, thank you, everybody, again, for joining us. Uh, this session was being recorded, so we will email this recording to you, and it will also be available on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day.